Hi, I'm Margot True. I'm the food editor here at Sunset Magazine in Oakland, California. And with me is Samin Nosrat. Hello! <laughs> she, she is the author of this beautiful new book, Salt, Fat, Acid, Heat, Mastering the Elements of Good Cooking, which just hit the New York Times bestseller list. And we are so excited <laughs> that she is here. Welcome, Samin! Thank you. Thank you for having me, Margot. Oh, oh. So great. And what are you going to make for us today? I'm going to make an adaptation of the light and flaky buttermilk biscuits in the book. Uh, I'm going to make strawberry shortcakes with rose and cardamom cream. Oh. So it's a good springtime thing. It's perfect to make for Mother's Day. Yeah. Make it for your mom. Yeah. Perfect. perfect. Yeah, and it gives us a chance to talk about fat. Fat. Yeah. Yes, one of the elements, of course, in your title. Yeah. So can you, before you get started, because it's important for people listening to know, uh, what what's an overview of the book that you could give us? So um, essentially, it's kind of like a cooking school in a book. And I, um, you know, my story is that I grew up eating, but not cooking. I mm -hmm. loved eating always. And I sort of serendipitously ended up in the Chez Panisse kitchen, uh, you know, with Alice Waters' famous institution. And mm -hmm through a series of kind of quirky events led me there and I found myself cooking next to these amazing professional cooks while I knew nothing. I was 19 years old and the menu there changes every day with the seasons and with the d different available ingredients and so every day we were making different things and I had no idea how to reconcile what I was watching happening in the kitchen. The cooks would come in, be assigned their dishes, go get up and cook without recipes, without precise temperatures in the mm -hmm. oven, without precise quantities and make everything perfect and delicious. And yet, you know, they told me to go home every night and read cookbooks to study. And it wasn't being reflected. What we were doing was not being reflected in what I was reading. And so it was very mind boggling. I had a headache for about two years, <laughs> constantly just trying to tread water and keep up. And then eventually I started to see these patterns and I realized that the professional cooks sort of have this mnemonic device or this compass of these four elements, salt, mm -hmm. fat, acid, and heat that guide them through the kitchen. You know, it doesn't matter if they're making French food or Italian or Spanish or Moroccan food. They're sort of basic tenets that all good cooks from around the world know. And I felt like I had this incredible, beautiful mind, light bulb moment. Uh, I was 20 years old. I went to the chef who was my mentor and I said, Chris, I figured this out. I'm so smart, like I figured it out. Salt, fat, acid, heat, it's how we cook. And he just looked at me, he was so unimpressed and he said, yeah, we all know that, all good cooks know that. <laughs> and I felt really betrayed because if they all knew that, why hadn't they why told me? They tell you? <laughs> oh. you know, and I had been sort of, bit my mind. I, I didn't know the difference between parsley and cilantro when I showed up. And so it was just this massive amount of information I was trying to process and organize in my mind. And here was this beautiful philosophy that I could use and so, um, I knew that since they hadn't told me, and it wasn't in any of the books that I had read, that probably most people didn't know. And so it became how I organized everything I learned, and then eventually it became uh, this book. The book. Yeah. Right? Fantastic. Well, and also very important, you guys who are watching, ask Samin questions. She can answer anything. Mm. She really can. <laughs> I have heard Or her. I'll just say, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> she, she really can. So please, please, please ask questions. Yeah. And, and mistakes it, are good too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mistakes are also good. And it smells so good in here right now. I just, it's just all the ingredients she's using. It's like she's a buttery deliciousness. Yeah. Buttery yeah. deliciousness. We're in a butter cloud right now. So she's going to show you how this all happens. Yeah. Cakes. So this is a recipe I learned from a young baker in Oakland, actually. Um, he's at this beautiful place called the Sequoia Diner. His name is Tom Pratil. And the first time I went and had one of his biscuits, I like fell off of my chair. It was so beautiful. It had risen really high, straight, very flaky. And I just sort of marched into the kitchen and I said, Tom, how did you do this? You know, he didn't even know me. I just found out his name. You just yeah. walked in his kitchen. <laughs> I was like, what is this? You need to come tell me. How did you make this? Because anytime I've succeeded with biscuits in the past, it's sort of been a one-off. Like I didn't know why. And um, his were so perfect. So he talked me through it. And it's very counterintuitive because in my mind, for all of the butter and flour doughs, it's really important to not overwork the butter in so you get big chunks of butter that turn into flakes. But he actually said that he worked half of the butter in until it was totally disappeared. And that's what we do when we make shortbread or anything with a short crumbly texture mm -hmm. or a tender texture. So that was why the biscuits were really tender. And then the other half of the butter he kept really cold and, and did the, what we are used to, which is to make it into sort of flat pieces that will become the flakes. And so mm -hmm. it had this beautiful benefit of both textures. And the other thing he taught me, which was really incredible, 
was, and so simple, is to wipe the biscuit cutter every time be- between ah. every punch and punch. Make sure you punch straight down so that the biscuits can rise straight up and they have nice clean cut. So, um, yeah, it's quite simple. The key is to keep everything cold because butter is not pure fat. It has some percentage of water in it. And so if that butter will starts to melt in the mixer and releases its uh, water into the flour, gluten will start to develop and you'll get a sort of a chewy texture rather than that tender or flaky texture. So um, Yeah, because the proteins form. Yeah, those, those all it all starts changing in there. Yeah. Pro- Spider proteins. Web. Yeah. Protein. <laughs> web of proteins, yeah. <laughs> Not good. So um it's this I mean it honestly couldn't be any simpler as long the key is to keep everything cold. Um So I have all the dry ingredients, which are just flour and baking powder and salt and some sugar. And we're just going to throw them in here. Now, did you have to chill your flour? I keep everything cold. Yeah. I mean, I'm kind of a cold insanity person. (laughs) So to me, you can't make it too cold. So because also my kitchen gets quite warm and my my, I run really hot. So even my body heat will start to melt the butter. Or if I look at it, maybe it'll start to melt so to me i'm terrified of the melt I'm feeling so. warm. <laughs> don't you feel quite warm I yes <laughs> so uh I'll just throw it on there and also look at this amazing mixer made out of copper this is my dream mixer i love it um and then throw it on there and just mix it up on low to whisk together the ingredients okay yeah, so you don't like, want to go too fast, otherwise it's like... So roughly, flour. roughly, what are your amounts in here? It's here? about three and a half cups of flour, four teaspoons of baking powder, a teaspoon of salt, and a half a cup of sugar to make them sweet. If you wanted savory biscuits, you would just leave the sugar out. Okay. Um, and Tom was very kind. He gave me his recipe, and I showed him my recipe, and he said, Oh no, this is horrific. You have way too much leavener in here. And so he sort of told me the formula, which I've forgotten for the appropriate amount of leavener. So it's about a teaspoon... It's less than a teaspoon per cup of flour of baking powder. So, okay. yeah, he's he's a he's a good guy. He's a, yeah. go visit Tom. Say hi to him. Yeah. <laughs> so we get that all mixed up, and then I have everything else is really cold in the freezer. So, do you want to? Would you grab yeah. the um the first just the butter for me, please? Yes. We'll start with that. Hi. Oh yes. Hi. <laughs> oh, you have a question. Yeah. <laughs> What's the name of the uh, bakery or restaurant you want? Oh, Sequoia Diner. Okay. It's so delicious. I feel like I'm doing an ad for the Sequoia Diner. Hi guys, you can send me a percentage in the mail. Yeah. <laughs> he also used to work at um, a really great bakery. It's on the corner. It's like the edge of Berkeley. It's Elmwood Cafe. Oh yeah. And that was, he also made those biscuits there and they still make really quite delicious biscuits as well. And so, but now you can make your own delicious biscuits. So we have this very, very cold frozen butter and I'm just going to, that I cut up into little pieces. It's unsalted. I like to control the salt so that I put in things by adding salt rather than salted butter. Right. And so I'm just going to put half of it and it's really hard. I'm just going to put half of it and I'm going to try my hardest to not handle it too much because my body heat will melt it and yeah you can hear the machine is like kind of struggling so i put about half of it that's two sticks of butter in there Mm -hmm. and then this will go and we have the through the magic of facebook live i've already done this (laughs) because it takes about eight minutes because this you want to mix you want to keep it mixing until that butter is completely completely gone and worked all the way into the where you can put your hands in there and it just feels like butter again so you mean yeah. like like flour like flour excuse yeah. me like flour yeah so no no chunks of butter remaining so we already did that because I didn't want to I didn't want you guys to suffer through eight minutes of mixing will you please grab the other magic one yes <laughs> awesome amazing so here we have our cold butter mixed into our flour and our Do dry ingredients see? oh yeah does everybody want to see what this looks like so there's basically it just looks like flour there's not really anything. There's no chunks of anything. It's all disappeared in there. Mm-hmm. So, okay. Yeah, cold is your friend. The freezer is your friend when you're making butter and flour doughs for sure. Um, How long did you freeze the butter? 15 minutes is plenty. It doesn't have to be rock hard. Um, okay. So, yeah, because also if it's really hard, then you just have to mix it longer. So, <laughs> it's like, is that locked? Oh no. What did I do wrong here? Let's see. Did I not? Yeah, oh, is this? Co- oh, this is coming off. That's what okay. happened. Yeah. All right. There we go. There we go. So now I'll just put the rest in. And this is sort of more probably what you're familiar with with a pie dough is we're letting this butter go in until it breaks down to the size of sort of broken walnuts or large peas. And that'll take maybe three or four minutes. And so we'll just let that go 
maybe while we chat or get the strawberries going, what would yeah. you like to do? What should we do? I have a question though sure. about flour. Oh yes. You know, there's all of this talk now about, at least in the Bay Area, and it's spreading other places too, about how we should be getting fresh flour. Yes. <laughs> that flour actually is a fresh product. Yes. It does, it's not supposed to sit in your pantry no, for No, it'll go years. rancid, yeah. It'll go rancid, even if it's like a year, you're supposed to get fresh flour, right? Aspirations, yes. Aspirations. <laughs> <laughs> I hope to be one of those people one day, but right now yeah. I just have the bag of flour in my... You right. know, it does make a difference, certainly in the way it smells. If you smell freshly ground flour, like it smells like wheat, ah. which is amazing. And it tastes totally different. And um, But I... I don't know. I travel a lot. I'm on the like. I don't have time. There's not my local mill yet. Maybe when there's right. a mill in every town, I'll be able to do that mm -hmm. <laughs> or advise future. that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So when we get back to like the original ways of cooking, yeah. I do. I do think you know Josie Baker has a great mill. Yes. Uh, I know Chad Roberts and Tartine's building a mill. And down in Southern California, there's a great place called um, Grist and Toll. Grist and Toll. Grist and Toll. She's in the L.A. area, okay. and she makes beautiful flowers and polentas with all mm -hmm. California grown um, crops yeah. and man her polenta is so good Ugh, so nice. her, yeah and she's she also makes quite like amazing flour but it's one of those things where if I'm in a shop that has it I'll buy it but mm -hmm. I often can't make the extra trip out to the mill right right <laughs> so the first the first bakery you mentioned Josie Baker his bakery is called the mill yeah. in San Francisco and the second one is Tartine, Tartine Bakery in San Francisco. In as San well. Francisco, yeah, and so and soon to be LA. And, yes, and LA Very as well. Soon. They're building a massive compound. Huge. Be. So, man, every time I go see Chad, he's like telling me they're bringing Neil's Yard Dairy in there and Chris Bianco's Pizza. There's going to be wow. so many good things. So maybe we should move to LA. You want to? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so LA let's is. let's see what's happening. This is still going. It's still quite the mm. butter's still in quite large chunks. So we could let yeah. that go. Should we work on some strawberries? Yeah, let's okay. do strawberries. So um, strawberries have just come back into season and they're starting to smell really good and taste mm. really good. These are from down the coast. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know, I don't, I just rinse them. I don't make a huge, you know, there is this way you can do it, the fancy restaurant way where you remove this thing. It's like so specific. And, and this is that, that mysterious verb in cookbooks that says, when they tell you to hull, hull, yeah, hull a strawberry, yeah. that's so what it is. That, it's sort of like removing this little core bit, but I am too lazy to do that. So <laughs> mm. I just sort of cut as, as high up as I can, removing as little of the berry as possible and just getting mm -hmm. the greens off. And then for these big berries, I'll cut them in half and then slice them mm -hmm. I like that. I don't take it too seriously. You know, it's a strawberry. It's just not... No, we're not cooking it. Right, right. And then right. the little ones, you can, you don't even have to cut them in half. You can just slice them. It's nice that you're doing it lengthwise, though. Sometimes I like them. you see the Yeah, it looks like kind of like a little heart. Or it's just yeah. really, yeah, super sweet. Oh, yeah, the other way. I don't like the other way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't so. preserve the strawberry shape. Yeah, much. this is more strawberry -y. You know, yeah. <laughs> and so, um, you know, this is one of those really simple things I learned sort of this is a great go to way to have fruit at home in a dessert and make it feel a little more special. Although a fruit plate can be plenty special mm -hmm. is just just to add a little sugar and let it sit. You know, that's macerating. Or um, I like to put a little squeeze of lemon juice because always that like, sweet thing is really nice where you um, you know, one of my favorite quotes from Harold McGee, the great kitchen scientist, is great. that um, all cooked food aspires to the condition of fruit. And there is just something like a ripe piece of fruit is so perfectly balanced. You know, if you think of that beautiful peach in the summer where it's sweet and tart, you know, like there sometimes you get a peach that's too sweet or too tart, but that really perfect one is sweet and tart or same thing with strawberries. So. For me, yeah. especially these early season strawberries, I maybe push them a little bit toward that perfection of sweet and tart if they need a little sugar or if they need a little lemon. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, just a little squeeze. Oh, sorry, I'm <laughs> sorry. Juicy. Margo's juicy. Yeah. Juicy. Oh, question. Can you remind us what you're making again? Oh, sure. We're making strawberry shortcakes with rose and cardamom whipped cream. So yeah. Um, yeah, so while our butter's mixing, we're sort of just getting our strawberries macerating. And then I have some other yummy things to put on there. And this is. Um, this is we. I don't know. I like I like cardamom and rose flavors. It's sort of in my mm. blood. It's very Persian flavor. So I like working it into the strawberries and into the cream. So I'm just going to put a little secret amount of ground cardamom in there. Mm. And then we have this beautiful rose water 
Where do people find rose water? You can get it at um, any Middle Eastern market. You can mm -hmm. get it at, and now a lot of regular grocery stores have it in their international aisle. I feel mm -hmm. like those are probably, and natural food stores have it a lot, but it would be in the Middle Eastern aisle. And then, you know, I'm so unmeasured. I'm such a bad measurer. I'll just put a half a cap full in. <laughs> and, so, and so it's quite strong. So just start with a few drops and work your way up if you want it to be rosier. And the, there's a lot of variety in rose water too. Isn't yes, there? There, and also yeah. the freshness. So it, it okay. will be more rosy if it's fresher because you know it's just a distilled product. You put petals in, and then the, um, all the rose essences. It's just the distillation of rose petals. So uh, it's hmm. your essential oils will dissipate dissipate over time. So mm -hmm. the fresher it is, the more rosy it will be. Okay. Um, and then I have these super beautiful tiny little rosebuds, dried rosebuds, that my friend brought me from Israel which I love so much. I just think they're really special and beautiful. So I'm going to crumble a few into here. Ooh. You can, I'm just removing the stem part and then crumbling some of the petals. It's sort of like an extra kick of rosiness, you know? Mm. Um, and that way with all of the lemon juice and the sort of, uh, let's add a little, we can even add a little sugar in here to help get it nice and juicy. Mm. And where does one get these beautiful little Well, this, you either have to make a friend who goes to Israel right. or, <laughs> or, you know, um, it's, one little trick I found out about these little rosebuds is a lot of people sell them as rosebud tea, fresh rosebud tea, or dried rosebud tea. Mm -hmm. So you, I, there's a tea place here in Oakland called Far Leaves Tea that I really like, and they make a beautiful canister you can buy. But almost any of the sort of fancy tea makers now have a rosebud tea that you can find. And, and you just want to find edible quality rosebuds, oh. not, the one, not the ones that are in the bath aisle. Don't oh. use the one. Yeah. <laughs> it smells so good, you guys. I, I, oh, I wish it's like a spring this. garden. Yeah. It's just lovely. So that's pretty awesome. Okay, let's check out this. Let's see if okay. we're probably here with this butter. Oh, yeah. So this looks great. Let me open it up so everyone can take a look. So we have nice big pieces of butter about the size of a walnut or a pea, and that's perfect. And now because we let it go for a few minutes, that butter is sort of warmed up just to the perfect point where we can do my favorite part of this recipe. Ah, hold <laughs> it there for one minute okay. because I want to remind everyone, if you're just joining us, I'm Margot True. I'm the food editor here at Sunset Magazine in Oakland. And with me is Samin Nosrat, who Hello. is the, <laughs> she's the author of this wonderful new book, Salt, Fat, Acid, Heat, Mastering the Elements of Good Cooking, and it just hit the New York Times bestseller Woo -woo. list. <laughs> and she's making strawberry shortcakes with rose cardamom cream. So let's do this. So here we're gonna just um, put that in so there. So now all the butter's been blended in. So all the butter's in, some of it's completely disappeared, and some of it is still in these big beautiful pieces. So what I'm gonna do is use my hands to quickly go in here and do what I call the cha-ching cash money motion, like cha-ching, cha-ching. And so there's these pieces <laughs> of butter that are now kind of soft, so I wanna smash them with flour on my hands so they're nice and flat. And that way those are gonna help make flakes when like here's one so just smashing it with my that's kind of perfect into this like flat piece mm. and so any i'm just sort of running my fingers and my thumbs through this how satisfying it's so good tom describes it as running your thumb along the um, tip of your fingertips and as i was trying to translate that into an action who is tom oh tom is the baker who taught me how to make this tom oh, right, Pertil. Tom, yes right. tom <laughs> who ran so, the wonderful cafe yes where the biscuits were so yeah, outrageous yeah that i had to yeah. chase them into the kitchen to find out how he made them they were so good right and so <laughs> quite generous young man um mm -hmm. all right so i feel like i've worked all the butter in there's no sort of pieces they're all flat chunks now and mm -hmm. so i'll just dig a well and now i have really cold cream and buttermilk that I'm okay gonna pour i'm gonna get that okay for thank you. you so much mm. Wow, they are really cold. Oh, really cold. Perfect. I like it sometimes oh when a little bit of ice forms on the top it and you know, you've done, you know you've done your job. So here's the buttermilk. Here's the cream. So you want them to freeze for at least, what, 15, 15 minutes? 15 minutes is plenty. Mm -hmm. If you go too much farther than that, then it starts turning into a lolly popsicle. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but two, it's all, this is all good. So I'll start with the buttermilk in here. And, and maybe I'll start with most of the cream, but not quite all of it in case it's a little too much. I feel like every day, depending on the humidity and just conditions and what was happening when you were measuring, things can be different. So it's good to go gently with the, li mm -hmm. with the liquid ingredients. And now I'm just using this spatula to um, gently fold it in, sort of with a scooping motion, mm -hmm. turning the bowl, turning the bowl, getting it all worked in there. And you really don't want to overwork this because that's, again, how like things get tough and gluten really keeps forming. So it's starting to get 
sort of shaggy, which is perfect. Mm -hmm. You see that? It's all coming together. So it's interesting that you can really pound that first part yeah, of the Yeah, I know. In there, which you would and consider now, working. Yeah, I know. But because it's cold and the fat and the butter and the water have not separated, uh -huh. there's just not a chance for gluten to develop yet. So that's why it's important to keep, to keep everything cold. really cold. So this is mostly coming together, but it definitely is a little too floury. So I'm going to add sort of maybe almost all the rest of the cream. Mm -hmm. Now, is the cream the one that you would go lightly on if you're not? Yeah, I think okay. so. Um, I would definitely add all the buttermilk to that tang and then let the cream be sort of the thing I'm, I, I hold back a little bit of. Mm -hmm. But now this is coming together. And uh, one thing that it took me a long time to get used to was this doesn't have to come together into a perfect dough. You know, it doesn't have to be a big ball of dough before because flour and it takes a little bit of time to absorb liquid. So by the time we roll it out and pound or put it down on our um, board and pound it out, mm -hmm. probably this is going to be enough. Yeah, maybe we can use a tiny bit more here. Well, I guess it was pretty much all of it. <laughs> I guess I did measure that recipe correctly. Okay. So, um, so, and then we can just turn it out and sort of gently, you want to be really gentle, especially if your own hands and body temperature are quite warm. So yeah, it's an, it's definitely wet enough that it's coming together, but mm -hmm. it's still quite shaggy underneath. You'll see it'll crumble back out again. So that's kind of perfect. And then I'm just going to gently bring this together. Mm. And it's nice. starting to come together and there's like some wetter bits and some drier bits and that's really perfect. If you make it too wet, sometimes it, the biscuits won't rise all the way. Mm -hmm. they'll, they'll just be weighed down by all that liquid. So okay. this is kind of, I kind of like it like this, shaggy. I mm -hmm. think shaggy, it's kind of scary because mm -hmm. you, you see people kneading dough so hard, you right, know, and right. like you want a ball of dough. But I think shaggy is good. And I'm even going to, what I'm going to do is get a little bit of flour here on my board help keep things from sticking. So I'm going to flour mm -hmm. this and then I'm going to start doing the crazy rolling. So the other thing that Tom taught me that helps the flakes happen is he uses the um, technique of making pastry, puff pastry or croissants, which is involves all of that folding. And yeah. so whereas maybe the kind of, kind of old school biscuits that I had always made, you would basically bring it to this point, punch them out and bake them. What, just like this. Just like yeah. this. Yeah. That's kind of the classic mm -hmm. way that I right. learned. Tom said, well, now everything's really cold and you're working quite quickly. So let's sort of incorporate some layers in there just like they do when they make croissants or puff pastry. So, um, and just start rolling this. And I don't know if with Ooh. your camera you can see, Come but look. there's all these beautiful pieces of butter in here. And that's what's going to make so many beautiful flaky yeah, bits. I can see these all butters that. are, that's your goal. You want to get all of that in there. And so, yeah, so that's quite beautiful. <laughs> that's oh, your goal because it, everything was cold. There's a really good mm -hmm. one. You know, they're right there. And they're not too chunky. They're not sticking out. They're nice and flat. So I'll just sort of roll and fold. And I'll do that three or four times. And that really helps flakes flaky layers to start developing. Mm -hmm. Oops, there we now, go. is that a worry at all? Nah, whatever. That? That's fine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Don't worry too much. That'll make your biscuits bad. Yeah. <laughs> and so, and then one more time. There's a piece of parsley or something. Strawberry dip. Strawberry. Yeah. <laughs> and then maybe one more. Mm. Yeah. Excellent. And this is nice. Do you see that it's nice enough and dry enough that it's not really sticking at all to the board. Mm -hmm. It's quite lovely. Yeah. And um, the Beautiful. other thing is that I always mess up on this step, but Tom, I think, would stop rolling about here. He would leave his biscuits nice and thick and tall like this, mm -hmm. about an inch or more high. So I'm going to take a page out of his book and, and I'm going to risk, I'm going to use my courage and do that today. <laughs> so I think we can, you know, maybe out of for good luck, we'll do one more. <laughs> but because um, the more times you fold it over, the more, the more layers. layers there will be. Yeah, but okay. you don't want to do it too much because then you're going to start overworking it. But this looks about right. And will, it's, will the dough tell you when you rolled it too much? Are you going to yes, start? Yes, it'll start. It? What it'll do is it'll start um, contracting, and that's really too far. So don't go there. <laughs> but this is it. I'm being really gentle. Um, I'm working quickly, and I think what I'll do before I start cutting, in fact, just to make sure we're not going to stick to the board, is get mm -hmm. some flour on there. There we go. Mm -hmm. And so this seems nice and beautiful and quite even. And I'm going to start punching. OK. So I my favorite. Oh, wait, is there a board? Uh, there's thing a I can baking punch? sheet. Perfect. A, Let's go on to yeah, that one. Grab it for you. I have this. Um, I think it's a two and a half inch is the size I really like. Mm -hmm. I think it's kind of small, but um, big enough that you feel 
like you're getting a whole biscuit. So here's my, oh, thank you. And then pop it out. Oops, I didn't. And another tip to help them come out more evenly. Oh yeah, do you see? If you zoom in there really closely, you can even see all of the layers. Do you see how there's already so many layers in there? Wow. It'll, it'll, um, helps it also if you dip your biscuit cutter in flour. And you don't need to butter your biscuit cutter, right? No, do not do that. Do not. <laughs> no, I don't know why. Yeah, don't do that. I don't know why. Just don't do that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but you want it because you want a nice, clean, dry cut. If you butter it, I'm worried that that would cause sticking. It would cause so, sticking. So, um, yeah, the, like here you can start to see there's mm. so many layers going to happen in here. Um, and so, wow. Yeah, and if, if you aren't if you somehow forgotten and, and the biscuit sticks to the side of your cutter it's going to slump over yeah right? that's what causes sort of the um the funny ding. yeah because <laughs> it's basically tearing yes the exactly and then it does, it's not having oh man that one is really <gasps> beautiful do you that's see that gorgeous. one there's probably like 30 layers in there do you wow. see there's yeah yeah tom would be so proud <laughs> <laughs> Now, has he eaten your biscuits? No, I feel like I need to invite him over. <laughs> come, come on come down over. to Sunset come right over. now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then, so I'll do this. And then if these are more savory biscuits, what I would do is I would just brush them with cream and throw them directly into the um, oven. But since mm -hmm. they're going to be strawberry shortcakes, I'm going to brush them with cream and sprinkle them with sugar. Mm -hmm. And um, so this made this many, whatever this number is. And we have this extra dough. And since this dough was rolled quite perfectly, if I may say so myself. <laughs> you may. <laughs> I, I, I'm not a believer in the re-roll, but I'm also not a believer in the waste. So what I like to do is um, create some biscuit sort of ends <laughs> and we'll have these are the snacks for the cooks and the family right like this is before you bring it to the table we get to eat all these things so um there's no need to waste them they're just sort of the funny little oh, and fun. yeah <laughs> and they'll they'll be kind of they're almost more fun to eat you know uh-huh and then um yeah <laughs> It's all biscuit good. ends. Yeah. You know, I, I feel like there's a whole realm to be explored in the little bits and pieces that are left over. Yes. Like yes. burnt ends, which yes. are now like a burnt thing. Burnt toast, right? They have burnt, oh, burnt toast, toast ice cream I've seen. Yeah, yeah, but even just all the little bits and pieces. I remember once, oh. you know, going to an Armenian picnic. And all the Armenian ladies, what they liked best was the part left in the pan after you oh. took out the baklava. Oh! Like, all the crusty bits, you Oh, know? I think there's a book in there, Margot. Scraps. Yeah. <laughs> Scrap cooking. People fighting over the ends. I mean, mm -hmm. as cooks, I used to work at um, Ecolo, a restaurant that's no longer open, but we made spit-roasted chicken. And our favorite thing to do would be to, after, at the end of the night, to just, like, sort of go for the chicken carcasses and eat all the, you know, the Pope's nose a little yeah. bit at the end, or the oyster, if that had sort of somehow not <gasps> the come oyster. off. oyster. Yeah, oh. and so it was, that was the great pleasure. And still now I have that bone in me where um, I'll... I'll serve everyone else dinner and then I'll just go back in the kitchen and eat the chicken carcass one. <laughs> and so you can be quite generous with this sugar and it's going to brown and turn into like a really beautiful sort of sweet crusty top. Oh yeah, you're putting on a lot. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, a lot. Mm, it's, <laughs> it's also good. nice to use um, raw sugar or turbinado sugar makes a really, or crystal sugar if you have any of those things, mm -hmm. but plain old sugar is all good too. Mm -hmm. And then this just goes into a nice hot oven, like 450 degrees, okay. and then I'll turn them after about 10 or 15 minutes. And I'll put it in for Great, you. Great, perfect. Okay. Let's do that. And then we can whip our cream while that's baking. Sounds good. Fantastic. All right, so same thing with cream, is you want to have everything cold so that the cream um, will fluff up and get really creamy and light. Okay. Instead of turning toward of sort of toward buttery dimensions, butter is good for the biscuits, but cream is good for the cream. <laughs> so okay. I chilled the bowl in the freezer for about ten minutes, and here's our really. Oh no, this is something else. Is that something um, else? Okay. Yeah, sorry. Oh, that's yeah. right, right. yeah. That's our popsicle of buttermilk <laughs> for another day. <laughs> so that's just cold whipped whipping cream. And, you know, um, I can't even remember exactly how much sugar the recipe says, but I just do a few... kind of to taste. Yeah, I do it to taste. So probably, like, let's just start with one tablespoon, maybe a little more. Um, and then we, same thing, we could just put, again, just a few drops of the rose water. We can always add more because it's quite strong. 
and then same thing, probably even just less than a quarter teaspoon of cardamom, just a pinch. I like a lot of cardamom. My best friend, the one who gave me the rose petals, mm -hmm. he's, al he's always accusing me of using too much. <laughs> so one thing I wanted to say about whipping cream is you can absolutely use the machine. You can totally do that or a thing, but you yeah. just don't want to go too far. You want to make sure that the peaks don't go past soft because that's really when the texture of the cream in your mouth starts to change and it gets kind of clumpy and fatty and buttery yeah. tasting. It leaves that greasy film. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so um, keeping everything cold will help you from getting that greasy taste and the greasy feeling, I guess. But um, a lot of people think, I don't know, there will be they, they somehow associate whipping cream or making mayonnaise with too much work, like it's too hard or my arms are going to get tired. And something I've noticed is that a lot of times home cooks don't know how to hold the whisk or hold a knife or hold things, spoons that they're using to mix, and that's why their wrists get tired. So if you see, like, for me, it's I sort of am just naturally now have this it's built into me. My wrist is always straight when I'm holding the whisk, whether I'm, and then if I somehow get tired, if it's the muscle that's getting tired is, you know, my arm, my bicep and my tricep and my shoulder, which are much stronger sort of parts of my arm mm -hmm. than my whisk, than my wrist. But, um, and then if I decide I want to change the angle, I'll hold it like this and still my wrist is straight. So okay. it's good to let the power come from back here, which is much stronger than if you're somehow doing this. I don't know. That, of course, will make you tired and give you carpal tunnel disease. So, <laughs> so here, and this will go quite quickly. Yeah, and you know, one other thing I'm noticing, I mean, about the way you do it is you're not going like this. Oh, yeah. Uh, you're just I'm, swishing it Yeah, around. just going around. You just want the action in there. So um, I had one chef who told me it was only acceptable to do a figure eight. Oh. Where I have never really developed that coordination to do that. But I just think any any old, you know, little kids make whipped cream in a jar. It, does, it doesn't yeah. matter what it looks like as long as it's happening. So, <laughs> yeah. and then you want to just make sure, and we can sort of dip our little finger or a little spoon in there mm. and see what it tastes like. It's quite sweet. It's, it tastes quite good to me. Mm. Mm. It's so good. It's like my childhood <laughs> rose and cardamom. <laughs> Excellent. Mm. Yeah. And you know what, what's lovely about the recipes in your book is that they all encapsulate theories and lessons that you learn about in the first part of the book, which also has some recipes sprinkled throughout it. And there are these fantastic illustrations. Oh, the illustrations are amazing. They're so great by Wendy McNaughton. Some of you may be familiar with her work. She's worked for the New York Times. She's worked for Edible San Francisco. She does the back page of the California Sunday Magazine. And she's her, a star. She is. She is. <laughs> and together, they're like this perfect emotion. Peanut butter and jelly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. And it's, it's just, it's really great because the lessons are distilled visually, but also kind of in theory, and then you get to put it into practice. So... It's a, it really is a cooking class in a book. Yes, and yeah. also, you know, my dream, it's funny, my friend Chris put it perfectly. He said, your, your goal with this book is to render it irrelevant. And I said, yes, you know, I want to teach you to cook so that you don't need to refer to a cookbook every time you cook. Of course, for yeah. recipes like for baking and stuff, we do need precise amounts and temperatures and times and measurements, but... Um, for most day-to-day -day cooking at home, mm -hmm. if you can sort of learn to taste yourself, taste your way there, and if you can learn that you know some fats need to be kept cold and other fats need to be kept warm, or how to fix something at the very end with a squeeze of a lemon or just some Parmesan cheese. Parmesan cheese is the answer to all ills, basically. <laughs> so, <laughs> but um, yeah, it'll it'll get you there. So, yeah, yeah, this is getting nice and thick. We're almost oh, there. Lovely. I have a funny story where. Um, the first time I made my a new friend named Tiffany a few years ago, I went over to her house and she lives up in the beautiful Santa Cruz Mountains in Bonnie June. It's so gorgeous and her husband had caught this wild salmon and we cooked this beautiful meal. Like It was just totally the most gorgeous thing and she had strawberries and cream for dessert and she pulled it out and she's not a cook and she pulled it out and she got out the little hand mixer like my mom had and started zooming it and it was you know fresh cream from down the road i was so excited to eat it wow. and i was there with another chef and we just watched with horror as tiffany kept whipping the cream you know beyond it was it went almost to butter <laughs> no. and, but we were it was the first time we met her so we didn't feel like we could tell her you know please stop <laughs> and maybe two years later i finally found the courage to tell her you know I don't know if you know this, but you've been whipping the cream too long. <laughs> she said, why didn't you say anything? <laughs> so, I know that's the thing. You know, I, I, you should tell people. 
but they're in, in their a, home. You know, but in a nice way. Well, I know. It's sort of <laughs> difficult, but they'll probably thank you. Yeah, she was very happy. And it's yeah. just a, it's a very funny thing where now I've learned i got to speak up. Yeah, and yeah. plus you're so nice to me. I'm trying to. Yeah, I'm trying to be. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you could tell people they're doing it all wrong and they would just be happy. If you give it with a smile. So we're pretty close now mm. to this beautiful thing. And one tip I'll say is even if you do use a machine, if you do use a whipper, mm. a hand mixer or a stand mixer, take it no farther than this and then finish it by hand because you'll really have more control in that last few seconds to get it to the right spot than the machine ever will. So this is kind of perfect. Another last tip I'll say about whipping cream is um, try to find non, um, non-flash non pasteurized, non oh, the like UHT, UHT, because UHT cream has been sort of chemically changed and it will never... It will never get that perfect. It always has that greasy taste, no matter what. So even yeah. if you don't whip it, over whip it. So and try to get, um, yeah, just yeah. non super duper pasteurized cream if you can find it. Yeah, and it's also harder to whip. Yes, it's I found, yes, I agree know, with that. Because the the protein structure has basically been compromised. Yeah, by that super high heat. Yeah. So it's you know. tough. It's tough. So, yeah. but then sometimes it's only cream you can find. So. Just do what you can. So should we make up a little a shortcake for people? Yes. Yeah. Well, people. Us. Oh, for us? <laughs> <laughs> we're the okay. people. Okay, we're the people. So. All right. I'm bringing over awesome. the, the biscuits. This is the magic of TV. Okay, the magic of TV. <laughs> well, these were ones that I made yesterday, and I want, to, I want to divulge that I did make a mistake. I punched them too thin. I rolled them out too thin, and I actually added all of that cream without going carefully and it ended up being too wet which is part of why they're not as tall as these ones that we're going to bake off today that from Tom so Tom if you're watching don't be mad uh, <laughs> so you can sort of just um tear them open or uh, let's see do you want a knife yes I maybe a knife would a knife. be great or use a fork even mm -hmm. there we go yeah perfect let's do that. let's find another this one looks kind of nice and flaky Oh, yeah, you can see the flakes yeah, there. Yeah, you can see the flakes there, yeah. Oh, it smells so good. It does smell so delicious in here. And then this is all about assembling this beautiful thing now. So to me, I like a lot of strawberries and a lot of cream. Oh, me How too. do you? Okay. I'm yeah. with you. <laughs> okay, good. So, so this, is, this is actually great. When you make a mistake, it's a, it's a real learning opportunity. Yes. I make a lot of mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's good to think about what happened so that the next time you can do it right. You know, I made these ones yesterday, so I learned to be more careful today with the cream. Mm -hmm. uh, and But the good thing about most mistakes in the kitchen is they pretty much, you still get to eat them. They taste pretty good, you know? Yeah. So, and you still get to come together with your family and have... Um, a delicious moment together. So I like a lot of cream, which means putting two rounds of cream on. So cream, like berries, and those pretty rose Oops. petals. Yeah, and to me, the spilling over is fine. Like I just get, means you get to eat more. It's Maybe a, a little thing. more cream. Mm -hmm. Maybe some more of the little rose petals would be nice on here, just to make it like extra special. Oh, so pretty. Wow. And because the rose petals underneath have been sitting in the strawberries, are they going to soften? Yes, they'll be bit? soft and they'll, their flavor will have fully released. The strawberries mm -hmm. you'll see are really rosy. And then mm -hmm. we can just put the lid back on, maybe like... That one's breaking, but I'm going to break it soon with my mouth anyway. <laughs> uh, yeah, look at that. And if you wanted to, if you wanted to be real restaurant fancy, you could even sort of put a few more strawberries on the side. Oh, man. And there's, because now the strawberries have been macerating with the sugar, there's this yummy syrup you could sort of drizzle around. Oh, I have to tell you a story about macerating, which is that the word sounds a lot like mashing. Uh-huh. And we, a lot of people who don't know will start will, pound. They'll, they'll, they'll see the instruction and recipe, macerate strawberries, and they'll just smash them up with the sugar. <laughs> you and don't need can, to do that. <laughs> it will not turn out looking like this. So remember, that's just, yeah. macerate just means put sugar on it. Yeah, just and slice it and it put just let it sit. It. Yeah, and then it the juices start to come out and the sugar starts to go in. It's really kind mm -hmm. of its own delicious, tasty thing. So should All we right. take a bite, like a yes. messy, messy bite? Please. <laughs> Let's Please. do it. <laughs> oh, man. Thank you so much. Oh, Shane. thank you for having me, Margo. Mm. Mm. Oh, I'm going to go at it. Oh, it's so rosy. Mm. Mm. It's so good. so tangy and mm -hmm. sweet. It's not too time. sweet, though, I feel. No, it's, it's good. not too sweet yeah. at all. I'm going to have. I'm gonna make mine a little open-faced sandwich here. 
Oh my gosh. Mm. The texture of the cream, the hand whipping is worth it. <laughs> it's worth it's it. It's really worth it. Give it it's, to your mom as a present. Hand whipped cream. <laughs> it's so billowy. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's like a cloud. It really is so light. I feel like you can't get that texture any other way. You can't. I realize now I've been whipping cream all wrong my whole entire life. You have so many more years of whipping ahead of you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> Don't worry too much. Oh, all right. I and won't. you know what I was just realizing the other day was my friend Max is five years old. And um, he's been mm. reading a book at school. I don't know the title, but it's all about Blackberry Fool. Oh. So he's really obsessed with Fool. So that's what we've been having for dessert every time I go over to their house. And Fool is, you know, if you, for whatever reason you don't want to make the biscuits, you can just make Fool, which is just whipped cream and berries, uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> which is so delicious, especially at this time of year, especially if you want to make mm. cardamom cream and mm -hmm. rosy berries, or if you can't have gluten, it's a great thing. You can build a little fool in a glass, just berries, cream, berries, cream. It's mm -hmm. kind of a great alternative. This wonderful British invention. Mm -hmm. I just love it, and I think he really loves that it's called mm. fool. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm making a fool. Mm -hmm. The biscuit is fantastic. The mm. shortcake, because it's so tender inside, and on top, the crunch and we still is got great some contrast. Good flakes, too. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You still do. Yeah. Mm. So, I mean, thank you so much. Thank it you, Margo. It's such a pleasure to watch Thanks you. Thanks for having me. <laughs> and enlightening. So enlightening. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thank you for watching. And uh, keep track of Samin. She's going to be teaching you a lot more <laughs> in the future. And she has a TV show coming up, too. Samin Joe. Woot, woot. <laughs>